Welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, thank you so much for listening and starting the week off with us. We had a long weekend. Happy to be back on the NSE. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1006th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a program associate here at The Rail, and I have the huge pleasure and privilege today of being your MC for a conversation with John Hauk and Chris Wiley. And now I will introduce our guest and host for today. John Hauk is a multidisciplinary artist. Central to Hauk's practice is how shadows serve as signatures of both the condition and the limits of our experience. From subtly folded and rephotographed monochromatic papers to paintings of psychological landscapes overlaid by personal objects, Hauk recasts the shadow as a hinge of illusion and illumination. His work is held in many museum collections, and he is a graduate of the Whitney ISP, Skowhegan, and UCLA's MFA program. And our host today is Chris Wiley. Chris Wiley is an artist, writer, and curator based in Woodstock, New York. His writing has appeared in numerous catalogs and publications, including L, Cabinet, Kaleidoscope, and Freeze, where he's a contributing editor. He writes regularly for the New Yorker's photo booth, and he is represented by Nikhil Beauchene Gallery. As a curator, he has worked on numerous shows at the New Museum and served as assistant curator and catalog uh, writer on the 8th Guangzhou Biennale, Biennale and the 55th Venice Biennale. Um, thank you both so very much for joining us today. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Chris. All right, great. Thanks so much for having us both. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to John, uh, which is something that uh, I do actually quite regularly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I mean, but I'm excited to talk to you in a in a formal context about this new show, um, and and sort of like I don't I don't know how many people are familiar with um, the whole arc of your work. So I thought that it was a a good way to start was to sort of like talk our way up to the current show, which is displayed nicely behind you um, yes. <laughs> ground. Um, and so the current show, you know, is like a group of these beautiful large scale paintings. Um, but you actually have a background in a sort of like range of media. Um, now we're looking at sort of like one of your earliest bodies of work or at least the earliest bodies of work that sort of broke through in a, in a gallery context. Um, and I wanted to ask just sort of like to get some groundwork, like what did you, um, what did you originally study? Were you interested in? I know that these, these, um, these works are sort of like ostensibly photographs um, uh, and, and, and sort of like, did you, were you interested first in photography or were you interested in the concerns that photography could address? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. And I also, before I do, I'd just like to say thank you to the Brooklyn Rail and thank you for the introduction, Eleanor. And of course, thank you, Mr. Wiley, for having this conversation with me. I'm looking looking forward to this. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I studied architecture as an undergrad and then I worked in software for six years um, at Sun Microsystems as a Java software engineer. Then I got my MFA and... Um, I started making these works, these folded works I call aggregates, when I was in the Whitney Independent Study Program. And that's really when my career started. It was right after that program when I started making the aggregates. And um, they definitely come out of an interest in photography. Like in grad school, I worked with Jim Welling as a thesis advisor. But I had a pretty eclectic mix of people I worked with. I also worked with Tom Main, the architect. I worked with Casey Reese and Heather Auberge. Um, one who is a more of a programmer and designer and artist and one who's an architect. So it was a very, quite a, a range of, of different people. And, um, you know, I, I definitely, I think at some point just decided like photography was going to be the thing that I engaged with. And, but, but I was interested in a, a non, I don't know if this is pretentious to say, but a non lens based form of photography, uh -huh. so, you know, really just making pictures. Um, you know, I think the, the best way somebody put it, I think it was Rebecca Morris, the curator at LACMA, she said, your work is a kind of collage where photography is the glue that holds it together. And I thought that's 
That's a great way to put it. Um, I think that's what my early work up until painting entered the um, show a bit more or, you know, my practice a bit more. It really was that that kind of practice. Um, so while not exactly photography, it certainly is invested in the photographic and picture making. Yeah, so if we could stop um, the slides for a second, um, because I think this actually is sort of going to be relevant to the discussion of the paintings and the work that we're about to see of your previous work. Um, just give us a sort of like quick gloss on how these works are made, because it's not it's not yeah. super apparent just from the slide um, that they are kind of like physical folded paper objects, but they have these kind of like impossible folds, these kind of like uh, moments of optical trickery. Exactly. Yeah. So they um, they started out really as like the grids, these combinatorial grids of color. And it was a way for me to get at the materiality of digital photography. Um, I was really into Wilhelm Flusser at the time and this his notion of photography being a combinatorial game. However, I had these, you know, index prints of combinations of colors and um, they weren't photographic yet. There was no light or shadow on them. And I remember studying with Jim Welling, him saying something like the ontological condition of photography is light across the surface with shadow. And so mm. I, I folded this piece of paper, photographed it to document it, but became so intrigued that like photographing a folded piece of paper, the act of photographing it takes this dimensional fold and flattens it back out. And so I thought, why not repeat this process? And so in the end, you know, there's usually two or three folds that are photographic or documentation of prior folds, let's say. And then mm -hmm. there's one real fold. Um, and so they are dimensional in the frame. Like they're, you know, they, they used um, kind of the way you would hinge a drawing. They have special hinges on them to allow one fold to be real and the others to be rendered into the piece, so to speak. And so, yeah, this this investigation I started, you know, I was in the Whitney ISP in 2009, 2010. It was right at the end of the ISP that I started this kind of way of working. And then it definitely the, the fold, the kind of rupture across the surface of the photograph um, started this entire, my entire practice really. And I still would say it's, it's there today in the paintings in a different form. And we can talk mm -hmm. about that, but that's really, for me, a completely formative moment, just folding this colored piece of paper and yeah flattening it back out i uh i always i i when i'm at my desk at home i have one of these right above my computer oh so yeah every every single day um so if we could move on to the the next sort of body of work which i don't how do you group this work is it under the title the history of craft paper oh there it is in the slide yes um, exactly yeah so um so i think this body of work, um, which is related insofar as it has this kind of re-photographing technique, this kind of optical trickery um, to the previous work, this body of work, I think, also lays a, a different portion of groundwork for the, the paintings that we're going to see and talk about, um, insofar as they, they deal with memory, right? Exactly. Yeah, um, I would call this my... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I mean, I just wanted you to maybe describe how memory functions. I mean, I think particularly in this image, which seems like uh, a very key one uh, in the mm -hmm. series. Yeah, I would call this uh, my uh, my psychoanalytic turn. You know, the early work, um, it came out of my experience as a software engineer. You know, it was like these grids. It was very rational. The only subjective element in it was the fold and the choice of color. And at some point when I entered into psychoanalysis as a patient, um, I, I started to think about all these objects and things that were from my past. And, you know, it, it was such a different way of thinking, you know, when you're a software engineer, everything is, um, you're, you're dealing with computer code, which is a very limited set of words, a very precise mm -hmm. language that's entirely about solving rational problems. And in psychoanalysis, suddenly I was thrust into this thing called free association and I could say whatever came to my mind. And it was just like night and day between thinking and code and actually just, you know, remembering things and letting mm. emotions and things just arise spontaneously. Like it, 
it taught me a tremendous amount that that process of psychoanalysis. And through that, after a couple of years of um, psychoanalysis, I started to think about, well, I mean, basically it started when I told my parents that I was in psychoanalysis. They were like, well, what's, <laughs> what's wrong with you? What did we do wrong? It became this kind of um, rupture uh, a little bit. And I think their way of talking about that rupture with me was to give me these objects from my childhood. So they started giving me things that they had saved in the basement every time I would see them at the time I was living in New York and LA and they were in Colorado. And so it occurred to me one day, I was like, you know, here's all these gifts that they're giving me that are saying at this, you know, on the one hand, like get this stuff out of our house. On the other hand, like, don't forget you are our child. This object proves our connection. <laughs> And so I started rephotographing those in the same way that I photographed the grids um, and as a way of working through those. Uh, and, you know, here, instead of like, what is the real fold? You're kind of asking the question, like, what is the last photograph? What is the most real photograph or object in this series of or the stack of, of photographs? Yeah, and that kind of translates to uh, the kind of like fallibility of memory, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's precisely one thing I really kind of discovered going through psychoanalysis is that the act of uh, remembering something is a very imaginative act. Like it's mm. not like recalling something off of your hard drive. Uh, and it's this, you <laughs> know, which is how I used to think about it when yeah, I yeah. Would pro program 10 hours a day. I'm like, oh, yeah, if a memory is like opening a file and there it is untouched <laughs> just right. as you left it. But you realize that it is a very imaginative act. And these, um, kind of layering and rephotographing in these get get to that idea yeah and i think we, we should we should underline or i would like to have you underline like just how significant and committed uh you were to the uh, significant the process was and how committed you were to the process of psycho psychoanalysis because i know that you you kind of like dove in and are still sort of dived in uh for for years and years in like proper psychoanalysis right yeah it has been a you know, I always say it's kind of silly, but I'm like, it's been more important to me than grad school or any educational experience being in, in psychoanalysis, like, especially as an artist, it's just been incredibly helpful for me to get in touch with um, my inner life. Uh, and it really did start at the at the Whitney program, you know, we did a lot of readings with Joanna Burton, um, psychoanalytic readings, and we were reading like Melanie Klein and Donald Winnicott. And I got, I was so interested in it, interested, interested in it academically. I thought, well, maybe I need to go see an analyst. And I talked to somebody at NYU and they, you know, connected me with a junior analyst who was uh, reduced price. And I showed up the first day with my notebook and pen and I was like going to take notes as if it was an academic <laughs> class. And he, you know, laughed me out of the room and I, I was no longer allowed to take notes. And I, I kind of, you know, I learned right off the bat, something very valuable that I tend to um, kind of over intellectualize things when there's a strong feeling. And why do I do that? And what what is the feeling that I'm kind of uh, buff, buffering by, by intellectualizing things and just opened up this entire world. So yeah, now I've seen an analyst in Los Angeles for, I saw him when I was in LA for seven years and now we see each other over Zoom a bit and um, I'm going to we're planning on moving back to LA. So I'm going to see him again in person. And, you know, in the beginning it was, it was three days a week, like proper on the couch psychoanalysis. Um, and then I became a father and had less time. So now it's uh, just once a week for now, but that could change. You, uh, you kind of ran headfirst into the divide between theory and practice. It sounds yes. like. Yes. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and, and sort of, you know, speaking, to analysis and your your interest in that like this series um takes its title from a famous book by donald winnicott right that's right yeah uh, it's his and, the and, last the last book he published playing in reality and one of my one of my favorite books um and that sort of uh can you can you describe a little bit of the the significance of that and this this also just to note uh, since we're going to be moving into the new show quite soon, is the moment, I believe, uh, when painting begins to enter the practice, right? Exactly. Yeah. So my last show with Candice um, was this, uh, these were in that show. And um, 
as you're pointing out, like I started to make paintings. Like in this case, it was just a, a painting on canvas. I unstretched it, photographed it, and it became the background for this piece. The shadow of the duck here is painted onto linen. Um, so there's both a photographic shadow going toward the left and then a painted shadow on the right. Uh, so more and more as time went on, painting kind of took over my photographic practice. I, I like to talk about it as like the fold was this, you know, mark across the surface of the photograph. And as time went on, then that fold became mark making, like just simple little gestures, like the, the prior photo um, of the the shoe tying, like there's little marks in there, like the orange part. Um, and it, it was just in the one set of the shoelaces is painted. And it's, um, it was just fascinating to me how just having one little scrub of paint on the surface of a photograph suddenly called into question the entire photograph. You're like, well, mm -hmm. what else is painted? What is, it added this other level of like, how do I pick apart this picture? Um, there's the re-photographing, but then there's also, it's being called into question as to what is painted and what is captured with the photographic lens. Um, so it started to do something really interesting. And as time went on, it got to the point where, you know, my last show in New York, it was largely paintings that were photographed. And I thought, mm. why am I not just showing paintings then? Like it, it was right. a lot of, it was a lot of work to try to make a, you know, a photograph of a painting look as good as the painting does in real life. So yeah, over the course of, uh, wow, since 2010, I guess, um, painting just entered more and more into the photographs, into the picture making yeah. until now it's to the point where, yeah, I'm making oil on linen, uh, paintings. Just, you just abandon us in the photography world <laughs> altogether. Well, I think, um, but you, one thing I'll say about that, I, I mean, like, these these works in particular, I sort of, you know, the, the way I set these up and the way that they're re-photographed, they lend themselves very well to a tabletop setup with objects. And so for mm. still lifes, it, it worked brilliant. And, you know, that last photo of the shoe tying is a great example where I had to have somebody stand and photograph them. And then I had to print out a photo life size of a person. Yep. And I was getting, it was getting to the point where this is just too unwieldy. Like if I want to go beyond the tabletop setup of still life mm -hmm. and these objects and scale up to something figurative, it's going to take me so long to make these things. It, it got very unwieldy, that process, and I kind of found the boundaries of it. And the, yeah. yeah, once I left the tabletop to to do something with figures, it it just became a bit unwieldy. And, and that's where like painting started to make more sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it would be helpful for uh, some of the listeners who, uh, or I guess viewers as well, uh, who are not kind of there at the time, um, that like these works also kind of existed within a context, right? Where there was a group of artists who uh, were exploring kind of like the boundaries of photography and the way in which photography could kind of like intermingle with other media. Um, and my, uh, my sort of like pet theory about that at the time and still now um, was that we were all, um, you know, sort of trying to reckon with uh, the proliferation of images in the sort of digital world um, and the sort of prevalence of a new form of consuming images on the screen. Yes. Uh, and so I, am I, am I accurate about that in your, in your thinking or? Absolutely. Your... No, it, it, it reminds me, you know, when I was living in LA right after grad school, there was this symposium uh, called Words Without Pictures that was largely about yeah. all those topics you're mentioning and photography. And I think that's also largely why I really leaned into photography at that time. It was such a fascinating conversation. It was just the critical interest in photography at that moment was was incredible. The conversation was really next level. And, you know, that symposium, I would go to all those talks at LACMA and it just opened up this entire world to me. Um, and I there was a book that came out of it. It, it was a, a really important time uh, for photography. Yeah, yeah. It was really, it was very, it was electric and galvanizing. It's mm -hmm. kind of like the 
the eye of Sauron of the art world kind of like turned on the little corner of photography for a second there. Um, it really did. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Um, but so let's talk about um, your transition to painting, um, which I think is sort of next in the slideshow, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, okay. And, you know, <laughs> you are someone who probably more than anyone that I know uh, never does anything half-assed. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, you know, this uh, this sort of like initial uh, dalliance with painting, uh, you know, kind of grew, as you said, into a, a sort of painting takeover. Um, but it wasn't just that you, uh, I don't know, like sat alone in your studio and kind of like practiced your technique, right? Like you, you seriously dived into uh, formal academic training in painting uh, in the in the pandemic, correct? I did, yeah. And I'll I'll just mention too. You know, it really started again in grad school at UCLA. I I took a painting tutorial with Larry Pittman, and he was like, at the time, you know, this was two thousand six or seven. He's like, well, if you're so into painting, like you should apply to Skowhegan. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. And I <laughs> I was like, uh, okay, I'll do it. And somehow I got into Skowhegan based on this like video works I was making at the time, which was such a incredible experience and I did that right after grad school in 2008 and got to be around all these incredible painters and see how they worked in their studios and I just I was like I want to do that this is the most amazing kind of rich thing uh it's so different than being on the computer all day or mm -hmm. like the technical apparatus of photography you know my studio has like when I was making these photos, I had a huge inkjet printer and a medium format camera and a computer. And it's just this very, there's an incredible amount of tech and um, technical mediation. And I was like, these painters are just, they're just moving this like colored material around on canvas yeah. and creating incredible things. And so it really captured my imagination all, all the way back then. And it's always been something I did in the background. And uh, as I mentioned, sort of took over the photographic practice um, and became a part of it. And um, but then during the pandemic, I, you know, I think I got really interested in it, this atelier way of painting. It's it's basically like 19th century French academic painting, like Bouguereau mm. is the main example, you know, who was Matisse's teacher. And yeah. you can see what happened there with Matisse and the break with it. But I wanted to go back to that moment of like Bouguereau and that moment when photography was also invented. Like that's so mm. interesting to me, like the 1850s when photography comes on the scene and disrupts what painting can do. And um, I wanted to learn what that painting was like. And so I, you know, Grand Central Atelier in New York has these incredible classes. And because of the pandemic, they put them all online. And I just dove in head first. And I think it sort of, I, you know, I was doing like different master copies and learning how to paint still lifes and a lot of genre kind of based things, mm -hmm. which was interesting. And I think it also was uh, comforting because you can look at an object, make a painting of it and know if it looks just like that thing, right? Like it's like yeah. software, there's there's a right answer, so to speak. And in my art practice, there's not a right answer. I don't know when I'm done. I, I don't know exactly what these things mean. Like it, there, there are so many questions and ambiguities, which is why I really like it. But this form of painting was so interesting and comforting at a time when the world was kind of unraveling. I was like, yeah. oh, this this atelier thing is great. Like I I can <laughs> I can parse this. I know when it's good. I know when it's bad. But then you know, as as the world went back to normal, maybe a little bit, uh, and I started to integrate it into my art. The this kind of painting, I was like, wait a minute, this is this is not interesting. Um, mm. it, it's too much of a right answer. And so, how do I make this style of painting that I learned work with my sensibility as an artist and I you know for this show I I think what I kind of settled on was this simple motif of painting the backgrounds from imagination painting objects that float on top of these backgrounds and having the shadow be this bridge between the imagined and the real mm. and that that really worked for me in making it like my work and 
it would speak to the way the photographs are layered, but do that kind of layering in a way that's specific to painting. And um, because for a while there, I tried making paintings that like, I would re-photograph photos in the way that I made my photos and then make paintings of those photos, but it doesn't, it didn't register uh, in, in, in a way. Yeah, so, I mean, before we dive into the the content of the the paintings and sort of like i don't know maybe even try and exhume the the intentions that are uh, uh a mystery or a shadow uh to you um i want to I, I i think i hadn't really thought about this but i want to propose that like there's an interesting way that the the process of making these paintings now um is a kind of like extension of the work that you were doing previously not just on like a formal level um but on a, a a level of sort of like reckoning with our technological environment potentially mm -hmm. um you know i was just very struck by your description of like um you know seeing these painters at skowhegan and they're kind of like um their physicality and the kind of like ancient analog quality of their art making practice. Um, and it, it seems to me, uh, and, you know, tell me if I'm right or wrong, but it seems to me that like, you know, we are entering into an age now of kind of like, uh, move, we've moved sort of like past the digital into the age of, of AI, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the sort of like whatever third or fourth industrial revolution whatever they're calling it now um, and uh, and it seems like in that era you know my working thesis is that as things uh, begin to be automated more and more by computers um, the things that we will be drawn to um, are are human things um, things that exist uh, in a world of human touch or, um, you know, that, that have a kind of like, like haptic registration of our humanity. Um, and that feels like, like very present in these paintings, which also have, of course, like we'll talk about uh, a lot of sort of human emotion and sort of the presence of the, 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 the bubbling up of the presence of the unconscious. Um, but I was wondering if you can kind of like, uh, I don't know, say if I'm threading the needle correctly here when I'm when I'm talking about your your move away from the the digital. Uh, yes, absolutely. I've I've had, you know, over the years, many people ask me, like, why don't you use your your programming skills to make art and use that in your painting practice? And I I feel like it's kind of what you're saying. It's like where is the humanity in that? So mm. much of this artwork that uses co code feels like uh, a screensaver, you know, and there's yeah. not a trace yeah. of the haptic, as you mentioned, there's not any sense of touch, any sense of care, really, um, in the surface of those things. Um, and while I'm still really interested in coding and the technical and even still code once in a while, I... I really think that painting is a, an antidote to that kind of coldness uh, and rationality. And mm. um, in these paintings, you know, the bells and the kind of more painted from life elements. Uh, for me, that's kind of like the the um, echo of my photographic practice. Like mm. they're, they're really like, I think that's one thing I learned uh, learning the, to paint the, in the atelier way is like a painting can be more realistic than a photograph. You know, if we're yeah. talking about like fidelity of experience, like you think about looking at a Velasquez painting that that's, that captures much more what it's like to look at another human being with the kind of, you know, fuzzy edges and the roundness <laughs> of our, our field of vision. And you compare that with say um, a Thomas Roof photograph of a person which is yeah. sharp all over and it's nothing like our perception of the world of, or in the perception of another person. So yeah, I guess I, all that's to say, like, I really am interested in this uh, as being a counterweight to the really technical and AI sort of focused world that we live in. Uh, I think painting can, 
be a kind of um, a counterbalance to that. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up um, Thomas Roof. Um, I mean, I think you're particularly like uh, talking about like his early portraits, which are kind exactly. of look like, you know, they, they kind of look like um, glorified passport photographs, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, of course, there is a way in which like the eye of the state sees that as a kind of like a uh, form of fidelity um, mm -hmm. to the, the person. Um, but that's just sort of like, you know, the photographic equivalent of a retinal scan, right? And yeah. when you're and when you're talking about um, like true fidelity, um, there is this kind of like uh, mysterious and complex depth to our experience um, that, you know, the passport photo does not capture. And, you know, I think that one name for that mysterious depth, perhaps, is, um, well, two names, perhaps. One is uh, phenomenology, which is something mm -hmm. that you're really interested in. Um, and the other is, you know, psychology. Um, and it seems like these paintings are engaged with like both of those concerns, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was struck looking back at these, how much they kind of reminded me of, a, I don't know, a kind of like metaphysical painting, like uh, De Chirico. And, uh, and when we were sort of like pre-gaming for this conversation, uh, I remember you told me that this was something that came up in like your first painting class, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. When I made my very like, I mean, I had made like watercolors and stuff, whatever in undergrad, but um, I made this landscape painting uh, when I was studying with Larry Pittman and he was like, this is so De Chirico. Like, and I, at the time, you know, I, I had come from architecture and software and uh, didn't even really know who Dukiriko was back then. And it right. didn't come up and I was like, oh, holy smoke, this is very much in that realm. Um, but yeah, it's it's strange, you know, thinking about surrealism. I, I've been thinking about this lately and I don't know exactly what to do with it, but with, with the environmental crisis, it's like surrealism, I look at it very differently now. Like weather mm. patterns are so surreal right now. Like the way the world is, it's like a, it's given me a like a fresh sense of like that work in a way where it's like yeah. the surreal is now our lived experience and and uh while these aren't directly about the environmental crisis there is that quality of like boy things are changing fast in every one of these landscapes mm -hmm. there's some kind of event happening you know there's a volcano yeah. erupting there's a avalanche happening they're not just pastoral landscapes there's an activity occurring and and that's the thing that I think captures this moment that we're in where you know I always think about like I used to growing up in Colorado we'd go to Moab Utah like the southern desert and yeah. go mountain biking and camping and I would always just be in awe of like how ancient that those rock structures felt and in awe of how much time it took to carve those out with wind and water and rain and just the elements and it all felt like just this really long arc of history uh, and geological time, you know, like yeah. millions and millions of years. And now we're living in this era where things are just happening so rapidly from a weather standpoint, from a geological standpoint, it, uh, it's a kind from, of from um, a technical standpoint also. Techni ex exactly. Yeah. And, and so I think these, like these dreamscapes in the backgrounds of these paintings get, get at that kind of quality of like, things moving quickly it's no longer this um and maybe that was my own naivete in childhood or whatever but i i really do feel like there's a lot at stake right now and things are happening incredibly fast and these yeah i mean i i think that the sort of uh the figure of the smoking volcano mm -hmm. kind of really gets to the heart of what you're talking about you know it it, it is a sort of indicator that perhaps like we are on the brink of an eruption you know like there is this sort of force that is being like uh you know pushed up from the center of this like ancient earth and now suddenly we are uh, about to experience kind of like massive upheaval mm -hmm. massive change is that um is that sort of where uh where the volcano potentially comes from definitely that's part of it yeah i i um it also, though, you know, we, we've been living in Portland, Oregon, 
the yeah. last few years and we moved to this new house uh in a neighborhood called Mount Tabor which is uh, an extinct volcano and you mm. know we could from our house could see Mount Hood which is a volcano and Mount St Helens and we're like living in the ring of fire and uh yeah. it became really part of my psyche just being in this in this location but then on top of that last year my wife had some really serious health struggles and uh I wasn't able to work. She was in and out of the hospital for like nine months. Um, she, you know, I, I won't go fully into it, but essentially she had an ovarian cyst rupture and it led to sepsis and a number of complications. Um, and she's, you know, very luckily now much, much better in recovering. But during that time, uh, like I was, you know, basically a single parent raising our daughter and mm -hmm. unable to really work and, because of all of that, there was just this tremendous in in me this like a lot of stuff under the surface. And when yeah, yeah. when she got better around last March, I I started making this show, and I just started with these little color studies of volcanoes. And I was like, well, there's the really apparent fact of living on a volcano, but then there's also this metaphor of oh my god, like there's so much in me that's just trapped and stuck. And I've been through. My life's been turned upside down. Our family's life has been turned upside down. And um, I just, the volcano felt really real and prescient in that, in that moment for me. Yeah. But, but at the same time, uh, you know, I named the show Perfect Temperature Lava. It's because it's something my daughter used to say. And I don't know if it's <clears> just in the Pacific Northwest, but kids here all seem to go through a lava phase around the age of four. <laughs> they, they talk about lava all the time. And uh and one day she was like, oh, that's, you can stand over there because that's perfect temperature lava, but the lava over there is hot lava and you don't want to stand there. And it just had a, like a really nice humor to it. And also mm -hmm. a feeling, a feeling of like making the most of the situation you're in uh, because you can't control it. If you're in lava, you might as well be in the perfect temperature lava <laughs> and, yeah. and find a way to, to, to kind of find something um, humorous about it. And I think, you know, that's also a kind of quality in these in these paintings, I hope. So can you talk a little bit uh, also about the bells and the significance of like the bell as a as an object? Um, I know yeah. you've talked about, you know, them being sort of like a representation of the, the real, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and a kind of like trace of your photographic history. But like the bell particularly, I don't know, for me, I hadn't thought about this before, but like looking at the paintings right now and hearing you talk about this, um, you know, it, it sort of like seems like the bell is a thing that is rung to create, to like usher in like a new form of, I don't know, consciousness or to demarcate uh, uh, time. Um, and I, for some reason I, I started thinking, I don't even think they do this in in hypnosis, but like the idea of like ringing a bell and like putting per a person under or taking someone out of hypnosis. Um, so I'm wondering if we, where, if I'm hitting on anything there or uh, if there is a significance to the bells or if they just like, they're looking cool. Yeah, um, no, that's, that that's, um the bells are an interesting part. I think they, they do a few things. I mean, one thing is they're, they are a family heirloom. Um, mm. they, were my, they were my grandmothers. And so there is a way in which they tie back to the the history of graph paper in yeah. which all those objects were kind of family uh, objects. And I really always liked the kind of the strange shape. They look like a, a chess piece. They look like a goblet. They look like a bell. Like there's a kind of ambiguity in the form. They also are conical in shape. So they kind of mirror the volcano mm -hmm. shape, which uh, kind of drew me to them. But then also on top of all of that, I think there was a kind of, uh, I was like, could these paintings have some element of like synesthesia in them, like some <laughs> element of sound. And so the bells of course imply, as you pointed out, a kind of ringing or a sound. And there's often two or three in the painting. And to me, they, and then there's a string like that, which also implies a, a tension and something that could vibrate and make sound as well. So I really like the musical quality of them um, yeah. overlaid on top of the landscapes. And, uh, but there's often times where there's a shadow and no bell, which for like, me, right? yeah, which for me, like 
you know, makes them kind of immersive in a, in a certain mm -hmm. way. Like you could imagine an object over your shoulder casting a shadow into this painting and puts you between the objects and the painted surface. And on top of that, like this kind of like object floating above the painting, um, you know, in Western easel painting historically, like the space of Trump Loy is like two or three inches to get that to uh, operate. Yeah. You do it in a really shallow space, you know, like a thumbtack on top of a little cork board with a piece of paper, like it's all compressed. But here I've taken these objects and painted them on top of a landscape, which implies, you know, thousands or hundreds of miles of space and depth. Mm -hmm. And so there is this really, to me, interesting back and forth between a kind of depth of the landscape and surface of the painting and the shadows fall, you know, pretty pretty close to the surface in that way. So mm -hmm. there's a sort of like, hopefully an almost like augmented reality that you enter into. Yeah. And it's sort of like it, it, the, the shadows that exist without bells, they kind of like not only allow you to enter the painting, but they, they implicate the viewer as a part of the landscape. Like they are, uh, sort of, I don't know, like interpolating the viewer and bringing them into this, uh, this like, you know, quote unquote, deep landscape. Mm -hmm. um, they are including the viewer as a part of the depth, both like, you know, sort of optically, uh, but also, I guess, I, I think like psychically mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, uh, I don't exactly know we where we are on time. It seems like we might be running into a boundary of the Q&A. Um, but I did want to ask, uh, I think there's probably a slide in here. Um, there, there's sort of like a bunch of paintings in the show of volcanoes. There are a number of, uh, uh, like two, I think, paintings of landslides, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's this, this interesting... Uh, in to my mind like outlier painting of the of the ship on oh, yeah. the placid ocean um and i don't know if we can find that in the slideshow um yeah, that's it yeah so and it also has this you know kind of almost like jokey almost too on the nose psychoanalytic uh shape in the uh, in the smoke there which I think we have a close up of that it's, it just says mom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I was wondering if you could talk, you know, particularly about this painting because it feels like significant in the context of the rest of the work. Yeah, this one started uh, um, as, a, as a small color study. So one thing that I really took from the atelier training was to make color studies and those are mm. you know quick paintings you can make in like a half hour and this one was four by six inches and so uh, you know I, it really just came from a dream uh of this boat on the horizon and in the dream I kept trying to decipher like uh, there's a signal from the ship and I initially I thought it was SOS but then I'm like no it says wow and then you keep turning the letters and it can be SOS <laughs> wow or mom and um so i was just like that is just such a bizarre kind of language that's happening from this ship so you're kind of the viewer on the shore seeing this this uh semaphore so to speak yeah yeah and, and uh yeah so it really just came out of a dream and um started with this color study and i had it, that color study in the studio for like 2 years and i just couldn't i just kept returning to it like it's such a bizarre a bizarre kind of um you know moonlit scene uh mm. with this ship and i uh i don't know what it means exactly <laughs> in that beyond that it, it's a it's a very kind of mysterious painting and i you know tried to make the the mom element be apparent in the title obviously but but yeah. not as apparent in the painting yeah it's interesting i mean i'm not gonna like try and uh wick out meaning from it exactly but it is interesting that it is the only uh kind of like placid moment mm. in, right That's um true. There, is, there is still that smoke 
present Mm -hmm. um but it doesn't seem to portend disaster right right it is the more yeah serene of all of them that's interesting i hadn't thought of that but absolutely yeah Mm -hmm. something to bring up with your analysts Um, oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) incredibly he he was in new york uh a couple weeks ago and saw the show which is oh wow amazing um yeah um, it, it kind of makes me like when you were talking about this coming from a dream too, is th- this work really does feel um, the most connected to, I guess, your unconscious, um, but particularly maybe your your dream life of all of the work that you've made so far. Would you say that's kind of true? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it does feel that way. I definitely have that. uh an interest in just like making these drawings or paintings from from dreams and then popping them up in the studio and seeing seeing what kind of resonates and this is just one of those paintings where it was less directed um whereas the avalanche one it was like yeah i'm gonna make a group in colorado that was a constant kind of and i skied a lot and it was a constant Uh sort of feature of that landscape and i wanted to make an avalanche and then i set forth to like you know, in charcoal, I drew avalanche after avalanche to try to to try to figure that out. But this one comes from a very different direction. Yeah, it comes from comes from dreams. Comes from the mm-hmm. you know, I I I think like a an interesting uh, sort of thing that just popped to my mind is uh, you again talking about going to psychoanalysis for the first time with your with your notebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, and trying to make it a kind of like academic exercise and getting laughed out of the room. Um, and it really seems like these paintings um, are a moment in your art practice of kind of you fully putting the notebook down. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I like wanted the background to be that, you know, like they're... Yeah they're painted spontaneously like the backgrounds I'll make color studies but I don't tend to use any photo reference for them they really do Mm. come from the imagination I start with just charcoal sketches a lot of times and see what happens when I when I make marks on the paper Uh and what emerges you know I love that that idea from Donald Winnicott that true psychic health is when you can surprise yourself he says something Mm. to that effect and I think in my early work the surprise was a fold across the 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 paper uh, and that was enough at that point for me but now you know as i've been in analysis a lot and i'm more mature hopefully in some level uh <laughs> the the ba- the whole background is just like this imagined thing and then the bells are actually that you know that more academic rigorous part of me that still is there but they're small moments now and they're on the top of the painting and they kind of triangulate with that imagined world of the background and the shadow is this as Christopher Bolas says the the unthought known um of mm. of these paintings it's the it's the bridge that, that bridge exactly i mean i was wondering uh like do, do you think that or do you have a sort of like resonance with the like sort of union idea of the shadow when thinking about the shadow here or is yeah. that? Yeah, I, I don't actually, you know, I've tried, I've tried to get into young. It's just not quite resonated with me. I, I yeah. definitely have more of an interest in like starting with the Fordian tradition, going through like object relations and Donald Winnicott and Melanie Klein and Christopher Bolas and Stephen Mitchell. Like that's kind of the, my arc in that, in my limited studies of psychoanalysis and mm-hmm. and experience as an analyst end um that's sort of where i'm more suited i've i've you know tried to read some young and it just didn't quite quite work for me um this one actually i noticed is not a uh is not a landslide but is a a cascade is a waterfall right exactly yeah it's just like a surplus of <laughs> a waterfall yeah yeah it, it sort of starts as this like yeah cliche kind of waterfall in the background but then it's just the surface is entirely overwhelmed by by the waterfall yeah there's the like not quite the bob ross happy little trees back there but um yeah they're, they're definitely getting unhappy uh yes. they get subsumed 
very simplified. I, I wanted to note this is a bit of a sort of like throwback to the previous question, but or pre, a previous part of the conversation. Um, but uh, you know, you were studying this painting method presumably while you were in Portland in the pandemic, and that was that was during the period where like there were those horrible fires um that you know changed the sky a surreal orange for days and you couldn't leave the house oh, that completely. feels feels like somewhat significant in the genesis of this work as well you're right yeah those were unbelievable i think that was 2022 maybe but yeah i remember walking outside and like the aqi in portland was like over 700 i mean oh it was God. just and you looked up at you could look you could look directly at the sun and it was just like a dim little thing in the sky. And it was, the sky was orange. And, you know, with the time where you're living in like a, an English, a really old English Tudor house built in like 1909 and mm. the smoke was just coming through the house. It, it it was, I mean, such a sobering and sobering moment um, to see that that could happen, especially in a place where, you know, it's technically a rainforest the, the yeah. where that forest fire was happening. It gets over 40 inches of rain annually. And here it was um, burning. It's, it's really uh, sobering. And that those kind of, like you're pointing out those kind of experiences uh, really have informed these paintings, you know, and I, I don't think they're directly about the environmental crisis, but right. how could I not have that emerge into my psyche when, when the world is uh, yeah when those kind of events are happening. Yeah, and not not to sort of like engage in, I think it was Ruskin who called it the pathetic fallacy where you sort of like psychoanalyze the uh, the landscape. Um, uh, but there is something here, you know, both with the sort of like bubbling up to the surface and somehow uh, present in the, in the environmental crisis itself is there is this feeling of the, the return of the repressed or something mm -hmm. uh, the uh the the bubbling up of these things that you can't keep down anymore like we can't keep down our emotions we can't keep down the consequences of our previous actions everything seems to kind of like be coming to the surface um it's a great point yeah like things are erupting and, yeah. and and yeah like what do we what do we do with that now like it's the coping mechanisms that we once had don't work to cover up cover these things up <laughs> yeah unfortunately yes um well it, it does seem like we've been talking for just about an hour is that true i i, I don't want to um cut us off but i feel like there might be uh, some questions bubbling up under the surface as well uh, that we might want to address. Um, I will, it, um, Eleanor, that, is it time for that or are we? You can, if you want to ask one more question, Chris, you definitely are welcome to. And we do have questions from the audience too, but feel free to just have a couple more minutes if you want. I mean, I guess the question that I want to ask to end it um is uh does making these paintings feel as good as you thought it would feel to be a painter when you were at Skowhegan? oh man that's a great question it it does i i <laughs> it's it sounds it sounds selfish but i you know i i started my career after undergrad working in software and i would sit at a desk 10 hours a day programming and just that's really hard on your body to sit there and yeah. just stare at a computer that whole time. And, and then my career took off in the art world as a photographer with this way of rephotographing things, which was great. And I loved it. But after a while that started to feel very repetitive to be in mm. this technical loop of photographing, printing things out, being back on the computer. And it, it worked great for a while, but then the whole while that was happening, you know, I was just, talking with my analyst about like how how kind of repetitive that can feel and how the world is much messier and and uh yeah. he was he always said this thing like 
the opposite of perfection is being human. And, and I was just mm. like, what? <laughs> I, was, I always thought I was striving for perfection, like in such a naive way. And, and so like, for me, the painting feels so much more human and um, the act of making it is, is really enjoyable. I, 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 I really want to invent a word for this one phenomenon that happens as well, particularly with like painting realistic things like painting those bells. Yeah. When I start painting them, they look flat on the canvas. And as I'm painting it, at some point when I'm rendering it, there's almost like a gestalt moment where it becomes dimensional mm -hmm. and it feels three-dimensional. And then I'm painting on something that's flat, but in my mind is like three-dimensional. And it's like an incredibly fulfilling experience, I have to say, to, to yeah. have this flat thing create dimensionality on the canvas. Um, so, so those kind of moments are incredible. And yeah, like I, you know, said before, just being able to, like Donald Winnicott says, like free analysis, uh, free association, sorry, um, kind of encourages you to just say what comes to mind and not think about it. Like, I don't have to think about what I'm doing. It just kind of emerges. And that's the most exciting thing about painting, I would say. And the feeling that you're out on a limb, like, you know, you can't go back and Photoshop these if if it goes right, south. Right. If it goes south, you you might have to paint it over and start over again. And um, that kind of those stakes uh, as as somebody making the work are are really exciting to me and intriguing. Um, that's not to say that you know I might not make photos again and rephotograph parts of these sure. and have a branch to the practice. But for now, this has been um, incredible to get to make these and to get to make them at a at a larger scale too, that involves more of um, like a more embodied kind of way of making. Yeah. yeah, I think embodiment is kind of like, like a key way of thinking about making these works for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you get, you, <laughs> you get away from a uh, coding space and back into meat space as they, yes. <laughs> they, they use um, so many bad metaphors. <laughs> yeah. But I think, but, uh, you know, at this point in history, we could all use a little bit more time in meat space. Uh, I agree. I mean, we're all on Zoom right now. Yeah. Um, but, no, you uh, can you can see why, like, painting is uh, so pervasive right now. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, there, there are a number of reasons, but I think that is certainly one of them, for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I think that that, you know, will become even more so the case as we get more and more of the proliferation of, like, AI-based everything oh yeah um, when you can write a few words and generate a photograph it's like well whoa what is yeah or generate a video or soon yeah. generate an entirely immersive environment you know with mm -hmm. procedural computing mixed with like text to video or text to like i don't know 3d rendered ai like that that's gonna be gonna be a game changing um but will perhaps uh make us long for uh embodied embodied space and embodied practice so. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's probably a good uh, good note to end on, uh, or, or at least my section of the the talk to end on, uh, and then uh, and and open it up to questions. But uh, you know, as always, thanks for talking with me, John. Uh, Thank you, Chris. It's been yeah. great. Yeah. Wow, that was such a brilliant conversation, Chris and John. Thank you so so much for that dialogue. Um, and we do have. A bunch of great questions today from the audience. Our first question will be from Jeremy. And Jeremy, you should feel free to unmute. Hey, John. Uh, thank you Hi. so much for going through um, all this. has uh, been a um, deeply inspiring talk. So, um, and you. I love the show. Um, got to see it a few weeks back. So, um, um, my question, you answered actually a lot of bits and pieces of my original question, which was earlier on, but it was just like, like I'm, I empathize with the software engineer brain because mm. I'm, I'm an artist that turned to software engineer and back to artist and, All and right. the, the, um, that rational functional grid transactional type thinking the all the, in, in the systems and, you know, um, my question that like in, through therapy, through painting and stuff like, um, are you, do you find that you're, that that rational, the grid is still there, but you've just pushed it out a few layers in the abstraction and that the grid is saying like, 
try to free associate a little bit and like, you know, is it, is it still there or, or like, can you talk a bit about methods or just yeah. ways in which you're surprising yourself or maybe not pushing yourself hard enough to. Yeah. I really appreciate that question. I, I feel like, um, you know, when I first discovered free association, I was like, oh, I'm going to become like Paul McCarthy now and just get, <laughs> get real messy. And I'm going to just completely deny that whole other part of myself that was exactly who I was from the age of, you know, two months old. And that's so, that's so wrong headed, but it, it, it felt so exciting at the time. And now, yeah, I think I feel more, more integrated as a person and that the grid is, it's still there a hundred percent. That's why those bells are in the painting. Um, I still, you know, keep up with, like, I'll look at Hacker Noon every day and like, I keep up with that stuff because there's a part of me that really enjoys that stuff. I think, um, and there's the creative brain in it too, you know, and, and there is seeing that energy and the pursuits. Absolutely. It, it is, um, I guess for me, one of the main differences is, you know, I played with Legos, not surprisingly, my whole, my whole childhood. And the great thing about those is like, they click together in a very precise way. And there's like an answer, there's a way they go together and you're like, okay, that's, that's satisfying. But when you make an artwork, it's not like that. It's it's very open-ended and it's social and the meaning accrues through its context. And and that's just entirely different um, than, than the kind of uh, rational approach. And I think as I was saying, it's like at certain times in my life, I really like the comfort of those things that have an answer. And, you know, I like to play chess and like those, whether where there's like a there's rules and there's a game with a kind of a finite game, but then it it can feel repetitive. So then I like this other thing, the the kind of more open ended and uh, more free associative kind of game. And and as I've gotten older, I think that's been able to kind of integrate those two things. And in all the all my work, I I feel like you know there's always that tension between those two worlds, and that's what makes it my work in a way. Like I've tried to make like, oh, I'm just going to make a painting that's entirely messy and I don't think about and there's no planning and it doesn't work for me. It just doesn't feel like my work. So, yeah, yeah, I guess being finding that integration of the two is really an interesting project to me. Thank you. Thank you for going through that and also a number of ways through the talk and now and again here. So, yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah. Wow, awesome question, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from GE, and I will ask on GE's behalf. GE wrote, would you say your work shows us that the future is a projection of near forgotten pasts, which the images exhume as the form, as if they themselves were shaped by a memory of which we can only catch an occasional glimpse? Thank you. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I think it goes back to maybe that, that idea that like, yeah, remembering is a kind of imaginative act. Uh, I do really think that the, the paintings kind of have that quality. Like every time you remember something, you're actually changing the memory of the thing, just the act of recalling it. And so I, I guess, I hope I'm interpreting the question right, but that's kind of, uh, what I read into that question is is that idea, and and certainly um, the paintings hopefully have that that quality. Um, and yeah, I, I you know I think a lot about I don't know if this is so related, but how the viewer can be absorbed into the looking process of these. And so with my earlier work, it was about this rephotographing, and like I would change the perspective of the camera and the lighting so that there's a kind of game to be played. Like you, you look at it and you think it's a normal photograph, but then you have to pick it apart. And hopefully through that, there is a kind of imaginative act of trying to figure out how this thing was made. And the paintings do that as well with the bells on top and the kind of hopeful, hopefully immersive quality uh, gets at that and, and activates the viewer's imagination. Absolutely. Thank you, GE, for that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will now read a comment on behalf of Paul um, in the audience. 
Paul wrote, there's a really interesting dichotomy between the presence of the bells as indicative by way of their implied ringing, of the perceived significance of an instant, and perhaps of these deep landscapes as indicative of the significance of in insignificance of instants as we perceive them. At any rate, I'm really enjoying all the deep questions and subtle puzzles. So just a nice comment. Um, feel free to respond. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, the bells do. I, that makes me think that, yeah, they have that momentary quality, like the way that the volcano erupting does. Like it's a, the bells are also an event, but an event that is more about our attention, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we just we just have a couple more questions here. Um, I, I have a question for you, John, if you'll yeah. have I am just thinking about the the presence of people or and like human behavior in your work. And I think obviously, as has been kind of mentioned, the bells kind of represent people in some ways that were, you know, create this really moving, strong connection between the viewer and the landscape. Um, but the landscapes themselves don't seem to um render uh like any people or or even like presence or traces of any of people um and i'm just curious about that and you know kind of how you think about relationships or just uh humanity and or humanity in the sense of like the presence of people in general as you're making this work or if you see it where you see it if you do and yeah, I'm just, I'm thinking about that in connection um, to uh, like thinking about the environment and the imagined world and dreams. And so that was a bit that's a, yeah. No, that's a great question. I, it's funny because when I draw like day to day, I draw people the whole time. And I, and I've been taking like, I go to like, um, you know, uh, drawing uh, like live drawing classes all the time and with the model like I I love doing all that stuff and I I've taken all these classes on anatomy and so that is something I want to have feature into the paintings more it would would be something like truly figurative but you're right these paintings feel like primordial landscapes before people existed or something even because the bells could be a stand-in for the figurative but there's no literal person in any of these or people and uh it's a it's funny because it's like one of my strongest desires is to make them more figurative and add people in but yet there's as you're pointing out no people so and yet it's something I do all the time so it is this funny like kind of uh under the surface part of my practice that I hope will emerge and you know most of the painting that I look at and that I really enjoy the most is is figurative um typically like environments with lots of people not necessarily history painting but you know more like worlds let's say um so i could see the work going going that direction eventually um yeah and and i i think too studying studying architecture undergrad yeah we the, like the figure has a sense of scale and what it can do to like an architectural space is always something that's really interesting to me and i think eventually including that into the paintings could could add another layer that's that's really rich um because yeah the, the the relational is kind of um could be more apparent in them so i really appreciate that question that's so interesting thank you i'm so excited mm -hmm. to see where things go and see what's next it's thank interesting you. to draw so many people on the day today and what, maybe there's like something about the medium that feels more closely connected to the people for you or I'm not sure there's so much to think about there so yeah I th I, yeah and, and the way you can render people in painting is just so nice because it can have such a range of interpretability you know they can be and our and our like ability to see people in things like a really simple few marks can register as figurative because we're just we love we're programmed to see faces and things you know I made a whole video work about that once of like 
all the kind of moments in Antonioni's um, film Blow Up where there's like uh, sort of static or noise in the trees, but it actually looks like a face. And I used computer vision software to find those faces. And it's still kind of haunting just how easily, how readily we can recognize a face in something. And I think, so all that's to say like painting is really good at that because it can be so loose, but still figurative. Amazing. Thank you so much, John. Yeah. And our last question today will be from Jonathan. Um, Jonathan, I'll give you the chance to unmute if you'd like. Otherwise. Hey, John. Hey, Jonathan. Question. Uh, you've been making these paintings and playing with the tension of what's real and what's perceived. And we've had a lot of conversations, but I've never asked you this question. Have you ever thought or toyed with the idea of what it's like for a mind to become unhinged and to lose its tether from that reality and what the representation of that might look like. Uh, and I sort of wrote a tagline in the comments about this would be like Trump Loy as psychic break. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, I guess I feel like, uh, when I make when I make the paintings and it's working uh, at its best, I not that I feel unhinged, but I definitely feel more like in a trance state or a kind of altered psychic state, let's say. So, and this is unaided by anything except for coffee, um, and it and it just seems to to work really well as a as a practice. So. I really like that question, but I think it's already maybe in the paintings themselves, just through the act of making them. It 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 gets me into that kind of altered state in a way. And um, but yeah, a full psychic break of I mean, that's exciting to think about how how far it could be pushed um in terms of its legibility perhaps, and how strange the spatial conditions could become in, in that scenario. I, I definitely like to think about that. Um, yeah. Does that sort of get at what you're asking, Jonathan? Oh. <laughs> unmute. There we go. Now I can unmute. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, I think that, that does get after it. I, I, I was curious just because I think that there's a there's a lot of kind of photography and film and and representational practices that have kind of tried to mine some of this like you know edge of edge of reality of a mind losing its own way right a lot of the sort of contemporary horror films do this in a very interesting interesting way and painting's more difficult a place to do it but you know there's I think there's a there's an edge to the trompe l'oeil, there's an edge to the representational language in your work that is interesting, especially I think in some in some cases those conversations about like, you know, the bell, the bell's shadow being cast on the canvas being behind you, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that itself as a model for then, you know, the presence of something that is that is unseen and that is that is you know that is that it implicates the space that you are in all of a sudden began to to appear to me or think that there's a there's a a dimension a psychic dimension there that is not just neutral right and mm -hmm. it's not just memory and it's there's something phenomenologically kind of edge edgy about that and i was curious about what it might be like to see that developed or enhanced or pushed in a kind of interesting way um at any rate that's sort of that's sort of where my mind was going I like that yeah it, it I guess it makes me think a bit about sort of what I like to read and uh you know it's always been puzzling to me when I worked in software like everybody I worked with loved science fiction right like that that was the the kind of language around one's reading that they would talk about but I've always been really drawn to more like just how bizarre real life is you know like like Raymond Carver and Donald Donald Barthome and like even Lydia Davis and like those kind of writers where it's um already our our lived experience is kind of unhinged if you just look at it on its own terms in a really clear way uh 
and I've I've always found that really intriguing. I think, um, and so not not that my, not that my work has that kind of realism in it as those authors kind of portray. But um, yeah, I, I think there is something about the kind of quotidian that's that's incredibly strange. And and the bells, I think, kind of have that quality of just being like, well, these are just bells hanging in space. But then. My gosh, they're they're not. They're really bizarre and spatially quite quite odd and floating on the surface of this thing. And yeah, but yeah, I like that question. I'm gonna have to think about that more. Yeah, that's an amazing question. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, thank you so much, John, for answering those questions. Thanks to everyone in the audience who sent in a question. And sorry if we didn't get to all of them. We got so many great. Uh, things today so many great comments and questions um we do now to conclude have a reading from john which i'm so excited to hear so john i'll pass it back over to you to wrap us up great thanks again and thank you all for the the questions and for for being here on the on the chat i really really appreciate it so i'm going to read this poem by uh, ben lerner this is from his book, Angle of Yah, which was published in 2006. Um, this is a book that got me through through grad school. And uh, there's a lot in the book. They're, they're mostly like prose poems. And there's a lot in the book about um, vision and visuality and uh, art as well. And um, also the absurdity of uh, American life, I would say. <laughs> but, but this poem has always stuck with me. And uh, it doesn't have a title but uh, I'll just read this now. So it says, the camera was discovered before painting was invented. The first paintings were made on the inside walls of cameras. Still, painting was the first medium to attain a verisimilitude capable of confusing birds, the highest achievement in any art. When Wu Daozi painted dragons, their fins stirred. The rest of the story is about flatness one-sided surfaces, a skin that speaks a vocabulary of rights. To explore color, we realized, leave it out. Like exchanging genius for its stroke. The bald girl is interested in boredom. I'm interested in, interested in, in algal cells and fungal hi-fi. Our grant is awarded in installments of cigarettes. We are trying too hard not to be funny. And that's that. Incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that reading, John. That was really, really great. My um, pleasure. Thank you so much to Chris as well for your amazing questions. Um, it's been thank you. absolute joy this afternoon to hear the conversation. Um, and thank you also to Candice and the team at Candice Meaty for supporting us as we prepare for the event today. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC and for making these daily conversations possible. They also support our archive, which you can explore on our YouTube channel. The Rail has been free and independent for 23 years. A donation directly supports our writers, production staff, and operations, so please consider supporting us through a link that's in the chat. And join us tomorrow for a conversation on Philip Gustin with Deborah Bricker Balkan, Mark Gibson, Mark Hudson, Steve Locke, Lisa Yugoskevich, and Harry Cooper. And thanks again, everyone, for tuning in today. You can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much. Um, this has been great. Thank you. Thank you so, so Thank much. You. That Thank was you. amazing. It was Thank a you. wonderful conversation. Thank you, Chris and John. Thank you so Thank much. You, and go see the great show work, at Candidates Maybe. Great work. Great conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, John. Thank great you, show. Canada.